A Zulu Girl by Ignatius Royston Danachi Campbell, more famously known as Roy Campbell. Um, South African poet, although educated in Europe, and uh, he was considered by many well-known poets at the time, such as T.S. Eliot, to be one of the greatest poets of the period between the First and Second World Wars, and he actually fought in the Second World War um, as part of the English forces. Unfortunately, he died in 1957 in a car accident. Um, and I just want to say I've had the worst luck doing this video. I've done this video numerous times, and technical difficulties like it not recording the video footage and there being no sound and interruptions, etc., etc. So hopefully this will be the last take. All right, so um, before I continue, as with any poem really, but particularly with this one, there is so much to discuss. And if you're going to analyze it at a you know home language high level, um, we would be here all day and you would switch off the video after some time. So I will try, however, to discuss as much as possible. Um, but if you can go and read up about the poem as you know more, it will all help. You know, the knowledge will all add to your repertoire of understanding the poem. But anyway, let's have a look. On the surface level, it is a narrative poem about a Zulu woman who's working in the fields, it's hot as hell, she's got a baby on her back, she uh, throws down her hose, she goes into a shade of a tree, takes the baby off her back and breastfeeds the baby. That's essentially what it's about. But um, as we know, uh, poems are very seldom that simple, particularly at this level. It is a, a political poem um, because it talks about the uh, oppression of the Zulu people but also the theme of power of the Zulu people is very clear in this poem and their determination and their resilience um, comes through quite nicely uh, later on in the poem. So let's have a look. When in the sun the hot red acres smolder. Okay so the acres, the land this large expanse of farmland, when it's in the sun, as it is now, it smolders. It's almost like it's burning, like it's about to burst into flames. Okay, it's really, really hot. That's what these pink words here are doing. They're, they're contributing to how unbearably hot it is. Okay, down where the sweating gang, okay, so the fact that they're sweating, and notice the word gang there. Now, a gang. Um, has a connotation of no individuality. You know, the people have no identity. They're almost like prisoners. You can get a group of prisoners to go and work on land, and you don't see them as individuals, you see them as a group of prisoners. Okay. Um, so that is implying that they are forced to do this. Uh, they don't want to be there, and that frustration is further shown by the girl flinging down a hoe. You know, she doesn't just put it down, she throws it down. One thing that's very important in this poem is the diction. In other words, the word you, the word usage. Okay, why has the poet used those specific words? And um, I'm going to discuss a lot of words here, um, such as gang, such as tormented, um, such as prowl, etc., etc. Okay, so take note of that. All right, why is it a girl? Well, that's showing me that she's quite young, and yet, despite her young age, she's having to do this physical labor. Um, in these very unpleasant working conditions. You could also argue that uh, calling a, a woman a girl is belittling. You know, if you call a man a boy, you know, come here boy, it's, it's um, undermining. Okay, uh, so we could argue that. The fact that she's throwing down her home means it's like she's rebelling against it. She, she would love to not be doing it, but she's forced to. And from her shoulder, she unslings her child, tormented by flies. Okay. So stereotypically, the woman's role is to look after the children, but now she has to go and work herself, and she can't leave the child on his own, so she has to take the child with her. So that's an additional you know, heavy weight to carry around. And this poor child is tormented by flies. Now, diction tormented, that word... If somebody is tormented, it means that it's you know never ending. It won't leave you alone. Um, it's just constant irritation. And so this child is helpless by these flies that are flying around him. And the flies, as well as the ticks, add to this terrible scenario environment in which they are working. Okay. 
Um, and of course, the child shouldn't be there either. I mean, this poor child, it shouldn't be in a hot field, but the child and the mother has no choice. Well, okay, they have no choice. So, uh, the second stanza, she takes the child, him, now, not being sexist here, but obviously uh, the fact that he's a boy is significant because he's a symbol of the future, he's a symbol of wealth, and this uh, promise of fighting as a warrior almost against this oppression um, that they're under. Okay, so she takes him to a ring of shadow pulled by the thorn tree. Well, there's a thorn tree nearby, a lonely thorn tree, which is not very picturesque. I mean, it's not very nice lush green foliage i mean it's a thorn tree so that image also adds to this very arid environment and uh, but there's a little bit of shade that's being uh, put there so it's referred to as a shadow okay by this tree but now again diction of the word pulled for example so here we've got this tree and then there's like this little bit of shadow that the tree is is casting on the ground and she's gone there uh, with the baby now off her back into this shade um, that's being pulled now if you get like a pool of water you know uh, the, the the idea there is that there is water but here there isn't any water okay so that word pool is actually showing in contrast how dry and hot it is okay you got to think to yourself you know the poet didn't just use that word for fun it's got to be a reason so it's it's contrasting to the incredible heat that colon there is saying, okay, what about the thorn tree? Well, the thorn tree is purpled with the blood of ticks. So what they go is that they'll go to the tree, they'll take off the ticks, then they'll squash the tick onto the tree, and the purplish stain that's left there is the blood that oozes out and splatters onto the bark. All right. Um, so the ticks irritation as well, like the flies. While her sharp nails, the mother's sharp nails, in slow caresses ruled prowl through their hair with sharp electric his hair sorry with sharp electric clicks there's also a bit of uh, contrast happening here because to caress is generally a gentle movement but sharp nails that's not very like pleasant okay that's not associated with gentleness okay and prowling is like a tiger would prowl for its prey okay like stealth mode okay so she's looking through his hair searching for ticks okay and when she finds them there those clicks where the nails squash the tick okay which is also a little bit of a harsh kind of uh, uh, imagery there sharp electric clicks kind of strong adjectives okay so um, <clears throat> the blue words there are suggesting that she's protective and that she's quite strong which is also in contrast to how we see here because here it's very much you have to do it because you're forced to oppressed don't want to do it that kind of thing but um, at the same time she's a powerful girl she's actually quite strong right and that is important to the whole theme of the poem also we've got these strong words here connotations but she's actually showing care and love which are gentle by being strong okay moving on Let's see if this is completely focused uh, there we go okay um, third stanza his sleepy mouth plugged by the heavy nipple it's like as if um, the baby is seen as a socket into which a plug is plugged in and and it's not just the the breast milk that's fed to the child from the mother there's something else as well and and we'll get to that a little bit just now um, but the river that they talk about here, yeah, um, like a broad river sighing through the reeds, uh, it's almost as if the river of the mother's milk is seen as something to put out the fire in the child's body. Um, and, and it will come further on about the unsmotherable heat and all that. Um, but what is important here is that sleepy mouth is a transferred epithet. Now, a transferred epithet is a figure of speech, okay? And by definition, a transferred epithet is when it appears that an adjective is describing the wrong noun. So here, it's not actually a mouth that's sleepy, because there's the adjective, looks like it's coming just before the mouth that, are, I mean, the noun that it qualifies, but it's not the mouth that's sleepy, it's actually the child that's 
sleepy. The baby's sleepy. Right. Okay. Plugged by the heavy nipple. Why is it heavy? Well, because her breasts are probably full of milk. Okay. And he's tugging like a puppy. He's tugging and he's grunting because he's really thirsty. I'm sorry, not thirsty. Hungry. All right. He's really, really hungry. But there's also something to keep in mind there. Uh, tugs like a puppy. A puppy is very, how do we say, dependent and helpless. Um, it needs its mother. Sometimes if you've had a dog who's had puppies, you have to actually show the puppy the nipple. Like it can't even find it on its own. Okay, so he's completely reliant on his mother. I've said there, therefore the mother is a dog then, if the child is a puppy. And, and that, I suppose, would play into the removing the, um, the human characteristic, you know, removing her humanity, in a sense, making her more of a gang member, removing that individuality, etc. Grunting and clicks are both on a matter peer sound device. Grunting as he feeds. Now, that word grunting as well, it's not a very uh, gentle word, like sound, you know grunting and I think it's important because as I mentioned it's not just the milk that's being transferred to the baby so as he's feeding that was a typo there um, through his frail nerves her own deep languors ripple okay that is very important because this is where it starts to show us what it's all of what this poem's all about she is bitter and angry that as a Zulu nation, they have been oppressed to do this horrible work. And they are not living their best life. They are not as a nation in glory. They cannot be perfectly proud um, because of the state in which they find themselves. And she feels like she's angry with that. Hinting at, you know, where she, fl she flings down her hoe there as well. Okay. But she's saying... It's not just bitterness and anger, it's also determination to fight back, to not just give up. And she's passing that feeling, that energy, through to her child. And the milk is the vessel, the channel, through which that is going. Okay, obviously there's not some special magic about the milk, but it's, you understand the concept. Because one day this boy is going to grow up and he's going to fight for what is right. And he's going to bring the Zulu nation back to its proud glory. Okay. So he, the baby needs that bitterness and that anger in order to make a change in the future. Okay. Um, but, he, but, but right now the baby is powerless. He's helpless. Okay. All right, and we've got a simile here, not just tugging like a puppy, but there's another simile here in that um, her this energy, as it were, is flowing, not just the milk itself, but also you know that fight. It's flowing like a broad river sighing through the reeds. If you can imagine a river flowing, particularly like I'm thinking Craddock now, um, a river flowing with lots of reeds on the side. And the movement of the water through the reeds makes a sound. Now that's personification, of course, because the river is being said to sigh, which a river can't actually do. All right. But that energy and the milk together are flowing through um, into the baby from the mother. Yet in that drowsy stream, his flesh imbibes. Drowsy because sleepy mouth. Okay, so drowsy fitting in nicely there. Yet in that drowsy stream, his flesh absorbs an old, unquenched, unsmotherable heat that curb the curb ferocity of beaten tribes, the sullen dignity of their defeat. This is a very important stanza because it's saying to me further of what was hinted here in that the flesh, the baby's flesh, he himself is absorbing an unquenched heat. So think of it like a metaphor here now, okay? Um, if you quench your thirst, it means that you're not thirsty anymore. But this anger, this heat, this ability or desire or determination to fight back is unquenched. It's not satisfied. 
you know, um, they are not content with the way they're living now. All right. And it's unsmotherable. You know, if you smother a fire, put a blanket over it and it will go out. But this cannot be put out. This fire cannot be stopped. So they are not going to just give up. They are going to have some form of revolution. Okay. And, and that's spoken a little bit later on. Okay. And let's just cut off there. But I've just said that strength, the heat represents the strength that they have. Also that frustration, that anger, that resentment together. Okay. It's the curbed ferocity of beaten tribes. Curbed means it's pushed aside. It's kept under control. All right. It means that they have this ability. They have this desire to fight back the oppression. But it's been pushed aside. Also, they, they themselves as a nation are a powerful nation. But they've been forced to be oppressed. They've been forced to abide uh, by a higher power, as it were. Okay, those in charge. Those instructing them. Um, so, they can't fight back yet. This ferocity of beaten down tribes. That sullen bad-tempered dignity of their defeat. So even though they're upset, they're still proud. Okay, they still have their dignity. Even though they are defeated, essentially, um, they, they are still ferocious and they are prepared to fight for what is right and to make themselves powerful again. Okay. Last stanza. Her body, the mother's body, looms above him like a hill and that word diction again looms means it's intimidating it's, it's this large entity so it's almost like we've moved closer and closer to the mother as we've gone along until now we looking right at the mother almost from the baby's perspective okay now notice the simile here uh, the body looms above the child like a hill within whose shade a village lies at rest. If you are a nomad and you want to build a village somewhere, you're not going to go into like the middle of nowhere on a flat land. You're going to go somewhere where the hills, because hills provide protection, not only in terms of, you know, entrance and exit points to protect yourself from enemies, because hills make it difficult to attack, but also like weather-wise, okay, wind, etc. So, She's protecting him. She's a very protective mother, as we discussed earlier on. Okay, so she's protecting him like a hill would protect a village. And this village is at rest now, but it won't always be. See, it's like we can't do anything about our situation now, but we've got this fight in us, and we are going to eventually. Or the simile continues here that her body looms above him like a first cloud maybe like her body i mean sorry um yes her body is like a first cloud so terrible and still that bears the coming harvest in its breast so if you think about it if it's really hot like this in the day chances are depending on where you are in the country um you're going to get a thunderstorm later on all right because of all that built up heat up drafts so it makes sense then in a literal sense that you're going to see the storm coming. But the storm stands for something else, doesn't it? Um, it stands for the beginning of our fight for freedom and to rid ourselves of oppression. Okay, so it's the, the first cloud is the sign of, you know, evidence of a thunderstorm coming. And a thunderstorm is something that's unpleasant. I mean, uh, you know, it can be destructive, but it's necessary. It is necessary to have a harvest. And if we take it into the um, figurative sense, we're going to have land, which they are on, because they're plowing it, all right, and all that. Um, we need that rain that comes from that thunderstorm. And that rain is going to make the plants grow. And when it comes harvest time, we're going to be able to um, collect the, the fruits of our labors, you know, to reap what we've sown. So similarly, this fight for what's right 
is not going to be easy and it's going to take time but it it's coming it's in the future and so i've written there this coming harvest is the impending rise and rebellion of the zulu nation of course this line is personification because um a harvest doesn't have uh sorry the first cloud that bears the coming harvest in its breast a cloud sorry doesn't have a breast okay so that's obviously personification and then I've written there this suggests the last two lines that the children of the oppressed people will one day reap the harvest of their suffering in other words they will o overcome their oppression and um, that is about it guys um, I've tried to discuss as much as possible in a relatively short space of time um, the poem has got a nice easy alternating rhyme scheme A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, um, etc. Alright, good luck.